just how thick she is. When uh, anybody in the area who is in the district gets together with the district, her name is Lucy Wilder. Now, in 1966, Cable was born 50 years ago. That means that. Thank you. 
forceful empire building time, summarized Brownsville Herald. Top figure in Texas, headline the Denton Record Chronicle. National coverage was no less attentive, and the list of his accomplishments filled several paragraphs. Public relations official for Texas Gulf Sulphur, board member of the National Rivers and Harbors Committee, National Democratic Party leader, special representative for the Port of Corpus Christi, and co-founder of the nearby town of Eloy. But perhaps the comment that would have tickled him the most was the reference to his support of an intercoastal waterway from Florida to Mexico as a hobby. Far more than a hobby, even though he had never been salaried, salaried only recompense for expenses, Miller's dream of a golf gouge trench connecting rivers to the world had been dreamed by others as far back as Florida <coughs> Early in the 19th century, Treasury Secretary Gallatin first proposed linking inland areas to the ocean by man-made channels. John C. Calhoun took the idea one step farther in 1819 when he suggested the United States Army Corps of Engineers do the necessary surveys, plans, and supervision. As the 1800s progressed, landlocked markets became international hubs of commerce as products moved along the Great Lakes, through state barge canals, and onto the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. By the late 1800s, Congress had a Standing Rivers and Harbors Committee geared to study and support any proposal that would increase national maritime trade and security. Northeast and Midwestern outlets took full advantage of the federal funds, as did southern seaports like Galveston and New Orleans. But the majority of the Riverine post-war Confederacy hesitated to support waterway development. Despite their reluctance, in 1875, Army engineer Charles W. Howard presented the first plan for an inland waterway west of the Mississippi. In 1900, the Corps of Engineers proposed aligning the creeks along the San Bernard River into a single protected channel. And in 1905, the Rivers and Harbors Commission authorized an examination from Donaldsonville, Louisiana, all the way down to the Rio Grande to study the viability of a comprehensive canal throughout the Gulf. New South Congressmen George Burgess and John Nance Garner pushed the waterway into national focus, but it would take a transplanted Kentucky to bring it to Texas' attention. Born in 1867 and raised between two rivers, Clarence S. E. Holland was no stranger water traffic, but he took trains as well, and it was on a railway trip outside of Chattanooga that he met Elizabeth Traylor and her father from the Lone Star State. Within a few years, he had married Miss Traylor, moved to her hometown of Victoria, and set up newspaper and banking interests in the area. As his prominence grew, so also did his concern about railroad excesses. Using deep pockets, rebates, and fluid freight rates, the lines have squeezed out any other form of transportation along the coast, and local farmers and businessmen were paying heavy tolls. So, a call from President Roosevelt for waterway competition in the early 1900s hit enthusiastic ears, Hollands especially. Already, the Army Corps of Engineers was surveying the nearby Guadalupe River for possible clearing. Why not deepen it into a full-fledged channel, extend the channel into a gulf-wide canal, and make the canal an international conduit for trade, both coastal and inland? Streamways could be extended into it all along Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and even Mexico. And ultimately, the same water trade characteristic of the Atlantic Seaway could be part of the Gulf. It was a vision of unparalleled splendor and practical. The estimates show that a canal 100 feet wide and 6 feet deep can be constructed from the Rio Grande River to Donaldson, Louisiana for about $2,600,000, stated the Galveston News. 
The completion of the canal will enable steamboats or towboats and barges with a draft of six feet or less to run from all points of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to the Rio Grande. When several such newspaper articles brought an enthusiastic response, Holland acted, persuading the Victoria Businessmen Association to hold a conference to discuss the feasibility plans and final construction of an intercoastal canal. He invited anyone who desired direct communication by water with all our deep water ports to his city. Townships, city councils, trade organizations, state legislators, congressmen, and newsmen got invitations, as well as Mexico's president, Porfirio Diaz. Inland regions were notified as letters flew out to Duluth, Chicago, Louisville, Kansas City, and St. Louis. The canal Holland promised would bring cheap fuel and transportation, and the response was overwhelming. Over 200 delegates came to order in Victoria at 10 o'clock Tuesday morning on August 8, 1905. By the time they dispersed Wednesday afternoon, conferees had re-established themselves into the Interstate Inland Waterway League and set their goal, building a canal from the mouth of the Mississippi to the Rio Grande. Created with five permanent executive council members chaired by Holland, and two standing committees, one from Louisiana and one from Texas, the league was now a lobby for the canal. But determination faltered amidst government snafus, voter apathy, and awakening angst. Necessary port towns began backing out of commitments. Negative engineering reports seemed the norm. This waterway is not worthy of further improvement. These wars are sufficient for the needs of present commerce. The improvement by the United States of the Rio Grande is not deemed advisable. Within two years, it became painfully clear that to succeed, the Interstate Inland Waterway League needed direction. It appeared in the form of young Roy Miller. Invited to the 1907 Houston Conference in his role as Secretary of the Corpus Christi Commercial Club, Miller's age of 23 belied his experience. Early years in northern Kansas along the Blue River had instilled in him as he called, a deep respect for waterways. A later scholarship to the University of Chicago put him into close contact with rail lines and river traffic feeding into Lake Michigan. A job on the Houston Post after college returned him to a city just beginning to dredge Buffalo Bio into the Houston ship channel. It was not until he landed a position as railroad agent in Corpus Christi, however, did Miller find himself a home, a small seaside town situated between one river, two bays, and the Gulf. Entranced with the untapped potential of the place and ebullient with enthusiasm, Miller launched himself into the community. Three years' time saw him editor of the Corpus Christi Caller, secretary of the local commercial club, prime mover in a campaign to bring a deep water port to the city, but a port in itself was not sufficient. To be ultimately effective, it had to connect Corpus Christi with outlets all over the nation. So in 1907, Miller attended its first interstate inland waterway league convention. There he caught the attention of Clarence Hoffman, who recognized the kindred spirit. Within months, the two men were pulling information, sorting alliances, and prioritizing goals. Soon Miller was bulldogging legislators for a canal as vigorously as he was for a port. And the effort was paying off. A 1909 telegram from Congressman Garner triumphantly announced a survey for both the canal and the port. And the Corps of Engineers confirmed the action seven months later. At the same time, Miller began molding the amorphous Interstate Inland Waterway League into a lobbying juggernaut. First to take shape were its finances, loosely accumulated for years. Under his suggestion, the League set a three-year target of $30,000, collected in annual installments from members to be used to propagandize the, the canal. Then he made himself unofficial point man for the group, calling on old port contacts, developing new ones, and traveling to every capital, national, and state powerful legislators met. Aggressively, he joined compatible groups, placing the league in company with the Mississippi River Valley Waterways Association and the Atlantic Deeper Waterways Association. Tirelessly, he visited small towns, larger cities, and hidden harbor enclaves, educating businessmen, bankers, merchants, and civic leaders to the advantages of 
water transportation. Gradually, his efforts brought in contributors from a paltry two subscribers in 1922 and when water lake adherents numbered nearly 100 before the Depression. Nor did Miller persuade merely to recruit. He also mediated, as shown in a statement U.S. Army engineer Colonel Beach made to the Rivers and Harbors Committee in 1913. The Corps' earlier unfavorable recommendation of a canal between the Saving River and Galveston Bay was made after discovery that it was not desired by either Galveston or Port Arthur. Since that time, he asserted, there has been a change in the feeling of both seaports. Bolstered by Miller and backed by Holland and representatives from the two areas themselves, the town's belated request for inclusion in the waterway system went through, and one more link of the International Intercoastal Canal was approved. As his importance grew in the league, he was now listed as Assistant Secretary. So did Roy Miller's responsibilities. It was one thing to push the the canal and the glad hand officials. It was quite another to manage day by day IWL obligations, getting local officials to collect data justifying each section of the canal was just one job. Securing core approval for a survey was another. Presenting affirmative results before the Rivers and Harbors Committee was confirmed, acquiring committee consent, congressional and administrating asset was a fourth. Finally, getting the money actually allocated was a fifth. All too often, promised funding was short-circuited by presidential parsimony, as happened in 1925 when a tight-lipped Republican shot down $7 million in coastal projects. This Coolidge ailment, <laughs> Miller's term, curtailed several canal endeavors that year but none more drastically in his eyes than the extension from Galveston to Corpus Christi. At other times, monetary allotments were delayed by legislative breaks. When this happened, the organization became a temporary exchequer, and it fell to the now acting vice president, general manager of the rechristened Intercoastal Canal Association of Louisiana and Texas to facilitate financial liquidity. Once local businessmen pledged enough money for the Corps to complete a survey in their area, they were contracted with the receptive bank to funnel necessary funds to the Corps of Engineers. When Congress, in its next session, officially allocated the money, the Secretary of the War repaid the bank and, in closing his books, assets considerably enhanced, as were those of the pledges, with interest provided by the association costly in the short term and occasionally risky. Uh, the arrangement underlined the financial strength of the canal group and its determination to keep things moving, neither of which prevented Holland from worrying about such transactions. How soon will money be available to refund banks and relieve guarantors in survey matter of Louisiana and Texas, he wrote Miller in 1926. The association is putting interest, which amounts to about $132 a month. It will be a distinct advantage to get this money repaid as soon as possible. But he toned down his anxiety. We are all very pleased with the good work you are doing, and close the letter with your friend and his handwritten signature. A concerned Holland was reasonable. Queerless cohorts were not, especially when they threatened dissolution of the association. Yet sour grapes lent a special wine to a resolution instigated by some delegates to the, Louisa, to the Lafayette Conference in 1925, and it took all of Miller's tact to respond. I am at an utter loss to find any reason whatsoever, he wrote the ringleader, for the suggested separation as proposed. It appears to be based upon the feeling, one could almost hear his voice rising, that, quote, Texas is inclined to disregard the interests of Louisiana, end quote, and the suspicion that, quote, Louisiana cannot reasonably expect that Texas is going to spend her money for the benefit of the Louisiana end of the canal, end quote. Simple logic and 
basic geography to the view to the complaint. Texas wants the intercoastal canal, he emphasized. If and when Texas gets a canal, it will be only after it's been completed through Louisiana. Does it not follow, he concluded, that it is to the interest of Texas to aid and assist in every detail to ensure the earliest possible construction of the canal through Louisiana? The crisis passed and Louisiana remained part of the association, but it would not be the last time nuisance bickering sidetracked supporters. But as irritating as such incidents were, the real, ch the real challenge faced by the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway Association was legal, persuading property owners to donate their land for government dredging. Here, Miller's work skills stood, stood in well, adaptive public speaking, as well as editorial writing. He could turn any audience into confidants. Accordingly, when he first addressed Beaumont City leaders about the canal stretch to be built between Plaquemine, Louisiana, to Galveston Bay, he made them privy to a basic fact. Before any dredging could begin, right of way must be secured for the entire route. It would not be easy. For large plots of land upon which new artificial channels were to be constructed, dictated the War Department, owners had to grant maximum legal ownership to the government are such adequate and indefensible easement as will ensure permanent dedication of the property to a public navigable waterway. The apparently unlimited access concerned Miller. This form of easement would seem to give to the government the right without limitation to use any or all of any tract of land through which easement might be granted. There ought to be some sort of limitation. His, pres his protest was summarily slapped down by the court. In my opinion, any, opinion or, or any objection made by landowners to this form of instrument is entirely technical and unimportant. Miller continued to prod the army, however, starting with sharing with canal supporters and association members accomplishments so far attained while bemoaning the district engineer's determination to sequester such funds until complete rights of way had been secured. Even so, in January 1928, the Texan felt confident enough to predict that all conveyances would be collected within a month, promising the Corpus Christi caller that construction would begin in 90 days and at the very latest in the spring. He was wrong. Survey snarls and attempts to deal with the great Mississippi flood of the previous year slowed Washington down. Undaunted, Miller continued to publicize incremental progress while reminding his readers of the purpose behind the canal. When completed, it will become part of the great Mississippi Valley waterway system, connecting Louisiana and Texas over 9,000 miles of navigable river. Finally, in February 19. Able to write Holland that the last conveyances from the southwest coast of Louisiana had been obtained. As the national economy moved into its first full year of depression, dredge boat operators began scouring bio bottoms from the Mississippi to Plaquemine, and others hired crew for a second dig from New Orleans to Morgan City. In the meantime, land rights from the Sabine District to Galveston Bay had been procured. Authority for advertising the work is expected daily, Miller almost chortled. Possibly pressured by politics and a worsening job market, the district engineer had finally begun allocating construction funds. Although rights of way were still being sought on the section from Galveston Corpus Christi, earth gouging vessels like the Caribbean and the Miami were beginning to become standard scenery on the Gulf. An earlier observation that completion of the rights of way will mark the most difficult part of the canal construction, since the actual dredging is very simple, was incredibly naive. And plenty of problems continued to emerge. One was the refusal of Brazoria and Matagorda commissioners to release property easements until they were relieved of responsibility for bridges across the waterway. Pulling every string he knew in Austin, Miller finally persuaded the legislature to put canal bridges under state control, but it was
was a bitterly fought battle. Holland wrote him about the outcome. It is the best news that I've heard for a long while, and I want to congratulate you on the fine work that you have done. If the Brazoria County commissioners and citizens do not appreciate it, he added, it is because they are ignorant damn fools. <laughs> the extension of the canal from Corpus Christi to the Rio Grande Valley. Envisioned as the final stage to the Gulf Wright effort, it had been the association's goal almost since its inception. But difficulties ensued almost from the moment the Rivers and Harbor Committee approved a survey. survey. First, the original officer in charge of the expedition died. Then several of the topographers were arrested by local authorities for poaching wild turkeys on Kennedy Ridge. <laughs> the clincher, however, was of course two times the reduction of the extension in favor of a tiny harbor already in use at the tip of South Texas. There would be an appeal, of course, but a sense of urgency, urgency began to permeate Miller's correspondence. Waterway projects were now part of the New Deal and funded from National Recovery Act allocations. Not only did the Gulf Channel have to compete with other projects, now proposed portion of appropriations could be annulled if not already approved. Shamelessly, Miller prodded the Chief of Engineers to fast track the extension from Corpus Christi to Point Isabel and even petitioned FDR to reconsider his priorities. A lack of enthusiasm south of Corpus Christi did not help matters. In a 1935 letter to six Rio Grande merchants, Holland noted, the fact that we had been unable to secure the proper assistance from the valley in securing the services of a competent engineer and the apparent lack of interest on the part of the people of the valley in the construction of the extension of the canal from Corpus Christi to Point Isabel and Arlington I suggest, he admonished his recipients, you people get yourselves together. In the meantime, dredging finally began from Matagorda Bay, south of Corpus Christi. In 1938, Miller reported satisfying, satisfactory progress now being made all along the line, justifying the prediction that the canal can finally be completed in Corpus Christi in less than two years. Six months later, he amended the date to 19. In the meantime, another segment of the Texas Canal opened in Freeport. In his missive to Miller, Holland described the festivities. The barbecue was delightful. A high school band furnished the music, and the program was carried out in a very nice way. A little sadly, he ended, everyone down here is sick over the European war news. By the time Holland and Miller wrote their next letter to the members of the association, European war news had become American war news, and the Intercoastal Canal a strategic necessity. Four months later, the canal was officially opened in Corpus Christi, and four months after that, the president approved it all the way to Mexico. Finally, on December 12, 1944, Miller wired home. The Senate had allocated funds $600,000 would take the canal to the mouth of the Rio Grande. It would be the last telegram Miller ever sent home. The next went out to all association members six weeks later. It is our painful duty to advise you that our beloved friend and lifetime president passed away at 8.30 this morning. Holland's death was not totally unexpected. His years in Texas had been long and terrible. In the midst of them, he had lost a wife and transplanted himself to Houston. Yet his devotion to the Intercoastal Canal remained constant. Stephen F. Austin must have worked with Mr. Holland in starting the canal. One way it kidded him at the Freeport dedication he had been at it for so long. Going on without him was difficult especially since the association's next meeting fell on August 8th, 40 years to the day when Holland first called an international canal convention in Victoria. The atmosphere was tense, the delegates all too aware that Japan had yet to respond to an atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima two days earlier. It was little wonder that Holland's patriotism was a quality most 
install that day. His determination to provide a waterway impervious to enemy submarines. Equally expected was the drive to continue the work of the association with Roy Miller as its new head. Most appreciated, though, had to have been Miller's comments for the future. With exciting discoveries of petroleum and sulfur deposits within their environments, coastal communities had whole new reasons to desire cheap shipping. So the Intercoastal Canal has embarked upon a policy of assisting interested localities in developing feeders to the canal, Miller stated. Harlington was scheduled to have its own side street built to the Intercoastal, and Victoria was already shipping goods down its barge canal. They, like hundreds of other Texas and Louisiana towns, would soon be part of the great inland waterway system envisioned 40 years earlier by Holland. And by Miller, doggedly and now alone, he continued the work of the association, reporting on vessels churning down the coast, engineers rerouting channels, and dredges running on electricity. But years had taken a toll on him as well. Hurricane in 1919 had demolished his beloved city just months after voters shut him from office. A hard fought campaign in 1937 ignited calls for a state investigation into his finances. Even his support of the association earned him detractors. Then there, that, there is that intercoastal canal he is building, one antagonist grouse largest and most useless ditch ever constructed. <laughs> in every instance, Miller had fought back, turning each setback into a triumph, even using the hurricane to get his city aboard. So when he was stricken almost a year to the day Holland died, Miller fought back, setting up his hospital room at Johns Hopkins into a mini office and persuading son Dale to act as surrogate at an April hearing Rivers and Harbors Committee. His next letter to association members contained four pages of closely written data relating to existing projects in Louisiana and Texas, most of which have a direct relationship to the Intercoastal Canal, he assured them. The next day he was dead. The association went on, as did the canal. Less than three years later, the Caribbean and the Miami met off the mudflats of the Laguna Madre, just off the coast from King Ranch. Major digging was done. Dignitaries conversed with the scene a day later in a ceremony accompanied by military bands, cruisers, and a celebrity-studded crowd. One of the last surviving attendees of the 1905 convention opened the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. But it was a quieter occasion three years later that finally concluded the drama of this ditch. Months earlier, a dredger sliced through the Arroyo, Colorado, completing the final prong of the border part of the canal. On February 27, 1952, Port Harlingen was dedicated. Intercoastal Canal Association Executive Vice President Dale Miller spoke that afternoon. And at the end of the ceremonies, the Harlingen High School band played. Holland and Miller would have been delighted. Thank you.
you take Marine Center, there's a lot of information over there. Anything else? Yes, sir. Speaking of the waterway, we're from Wisconsin. We've been down here about two months, and it seems like every other day we get a report Bigfoot is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as we know, the day is still sitting out there. Anybody here know anything about that? About big, 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 big oil. Oh, big exploration. I have no clue. Y'all are a lot more into that than I have. That would be interesting. Didn't want to get you off the track, but oh, I'm so far off the track.